the, Afri the African Echoes family, again, I'm deeply, deeply honored to have the opportunity to appear here and to exchange my ideas with you. Uh, on the, uh, my last appearance at African Echoes, I think we were at South Orange Avenue and Littleton Boulevard. Street. Street? Okay. My demographics of Newark is not so well as you can see. But as I was thinking about it earlier, before I came here, uh, it's really a travesty being black in a country where blackness, and really in a world where blackness is tantamount to being inferior. I guess my work really uh, is a part of that struggle, you know, being black, trying to reconcile that whole psychological position of the suffrage of black people. And here we are, in a, I guess this is a school, this is a church, but we don't even have an institution of our own where we can have our meetings, etc. And I know you've heard that time and time again, but I'm, I'm longing, I'm groping for the day when black people will finally come together and reconstruct black civilization. And that's what we need to do today. That's what we need to talk about. The subject that I, I want to share with you is a very, very difficult subject. Not just for me, but for scholars who are more proficient than I am in this dealing with this concept. And the title that I chose, Cosmic Creation, that word cosmic, it comes from a Latin word, which means balance and order. So cosmic really deals with the word cosmos, like cosmology, cosmogony. And what I want to share with you today is the results of some work that I have been doing as my, with my studies of the origin of man. And now I've been studying for over 10 years on that concept, trying to unearth, trying to unravel, not only where life began, but how life began. Solving one problem only left me baffled and compound the situation to be left with solving another problem. When I began to study the problem of the origin of man, I began to see that if I studied history, history was not sufficient. That was just the initial step. Yet it's very important to know your history because if you don't know your history, you don't know your ancestors. And ancestors is the only thing that is of importance in the study of history. If you don't study the history of your ancestors, obviously you have to study the history of somebody else's. That's what the whole struggle is about, inclusion curriculum. But back to the point of history. You have to know your history so that you can know your ancestors. Because it's from your ancestors that you get your value and your belief system. And this is what lays the foundation for culture. That's how you get your cultural inheritance that teaches you what contributions your ancestors made to humanity, how they lived, how they act, how they behaved. You also get uh, the consciousness of yourself from the study of your ancestors. So then, if you don't have a knowledge of your history, you can't know your ancestors. Consequently, you can't know your culture. And if you don't know your culture, you, you don't behave humanly, you behave inhumanly. That's why we have such a striking degradation in the black community today, because of the absence of culture. But this is only a sociological phenomenon that we can change overnight. But in order to eradicate the problem, you have to have a sense of your history so you can know your culture. Now, in the 17th century, there was a common belief in Europe that the Earth was the center of the universe. Thanks to the Moors, Copernicus who was an astronomer. He had studied much of the writings that the Moors had left when they entered Spain in 711, and they stayed there until 1492. But at that time in Europe, there was a struggle going on between science and religion. And even after Coper Copernicus had given his thesis that the earth was not the center of the universe, it took over a hundred years 
even for Copernicus' ideas to come into fruition. Those pre-Copernican ideas that existed in the 7th century, 17th century Europe still exist in 20th century America in science, astronomy, biology, and chemistry. There is this, still this idea, this belief that life began on Earth and not in the cosmos. This is the most baffling question in the history of science. How did life begin and where did life come from? In the early part of this century, with the development of microbiology and biochemistry, staggering scientific data came forward to prove that life did not have a terrestrial origin, but it has had a cosmic origin. Terrestrial means that life did not start on land, but rather it started in space, and it had its evolution in space, and it evolved to a level to come to Earth, and when it came to the Earth, it was a complete human being. In 1925, I should say around 1925 and 1930, there was a, a very significant contribution made in Europe. This was a discovery of two, two tremendous scientific discoveries. The field of relativity by Albert Einstein, which shows the relationship of matter to energy and also using the constant of the speed of light. There was another discovery which is called quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the science that deals with the location of atoms out in space. This has probably been the most greatest scientific discovery in this era, the field of quantum mechanics. Because for the first time in European history, this allowed the European to explain the concept of matter, the concept of energy, and mind, and time. It gave the European scientists a new way to look at science as opposed to their, their view of the universe from a, from a material standpoint and from a mystical viewpoint. So what I want to do today, I want to talk to you about this whole concept of creation and how life began. But what I want to do with you first is try and put you to ease and not be terrified with anxiety about not wanting to learn science. In other words, what we need to do is to demystify this whole concept of science. It's only till we demystify these concepts that we can really begin to learn. And I can say this to you, if you are African, if you are black, if you want to learn, you cannot separate yourselves from science. Science is inseparable from black people. Any explanation on regarding the physical universe, the physical world, there has to be an explanation to explain how the universe began. Who created the universe? Was it self-created? Did it occur from the Big Bang? Okay? I know some of you still believe in that Big Bang theory. But we have to understand this in a more broader concept. Not only should we know, seek to know how the universe began, but we must know how life began. The other aspect of this, when I use, when I use the explanation for cosmic creation, the significance of blackness, I had in my mind, how can we explain the phenomenon of the Nile Valley? How can we explain the creation of the pyramids? Okay. How can we explain the phenomenal dance, the music that John Coltrane, some of the things that the, some of the dancers are doing, like uh, this new brother from the West Coast, MC Hammer, the phenomenal dances that he's doing now. What well, takes someone like Michael Jordan or Earl Monroe, the things that they do on the basketball court? What well, takes someone in the intellectual world like Sheikh Anta Diop, okay, or George Washington Carver? How can you explain that kind of phenomenon, phenomenon of creativity that was demonstrated by black people under such, uh, such painful circumstances? So today, that's what I want to talk about, the significance of blackness. Either the universe has
has always existed or the universe came into existence by some abrupt creation, such as the Big Bang. I believe that the universe has always existed. And the reason I believe that the universe exists because atoms and molecules are all around us. They're in between us now, yet we can't see them because we've lost the science of being able to tap into the subatomic particles that govern the universe. But our ancestors had that ability. The Dogon, for example, could even chart the stars. They didn't have a microscope. With these, with these discoveries that were made in the 19th century that I had alluded to earlier, the Europeans couldn't see the atom just with the naked eye. They had to develop an electron microscope that's a thousand times more powerful than a light microscope before they could see the atom. So back to the point of how the universe began. I believe that the universe was created, self-created. It always existed. But now to get to the root of the problem, this is a representation of the universe, if you excuse my, my uh, art. I believe that the universe always existed. Now, I ask the question, what is the nature of the universe? The nature of the universe is what? Blackness. You ever thought about that? Blackness. Now, think about that. Blackness. And in the universe, there is nothing. I'm putting a zero in here, okay, for nothingness. But there is space. And the space, that's where you get the blackness, okay? Now, a single atom appeared in space. Okay? The atom is comprised of subatomic particles. There are electrons, there are neutrons, and there are protons. Okay? Electron, neutrons, and protons. Now, the atom developed into molecules. The molecules develop into genes. The genes develop into chromosomes. The chromosomes develop into cells. The cells do what? What do they develop into? Huh? There's another stage. Pardon? No. Tissues. Don't you remember your biology? <laughs> tissues, right? What do tissues develop into? Organs. Who said that? Who's the good student? Organs. Okay, the organs develop into what? Systems, right? The systems develop into what? Species, right? Species can develop into what? Plant or animals, right? In this case, it developed into man. I'm not doing a very good job of this because this is not, it's not staying still, okay? It develops into man. That man developed into God, okay? Into God. This God, you could call him a cosmic creator, okay? cosmic creator. Now, I want you to bear with me for a minute. This is a, it's a difficult lecture to try to explain this in any amount of time, okay? But this gene, this gene, okay, that this molecule, this molecule that, that then goes into the gene contains the DNA, okay? The DNA contains information that controls the chemical activity of the cell, okay? Okay, it controls information that controls
controls the chemical activity of the cell. Now, the DNA, the molecule, was in space because this is what develops the matter, okay? Matter is comprised of molecules, okay? The molecules then are comprised of tiny atoms, okay? These subatomic par particles that I mentioned, the electrons, neutrons, and protons comprise the atom. Now, the space had blackness, okay? The space had blackness. And this space, again, was tied into the molecules, and the knowledge that was in this in the space went into the, the molecule, into the gene. That's the cosmic relationship that went into the gene. If you know anything about the genes, the genes carry the information, okay, that determines what you are, that goes into the chromosomes, and then the chromosomes, they, they divide, and that undergoes cell cellular reproduction. This is the concept of cosmic creation. It's self-creation self from blackness. This individual, this cosmic creator, created everything within the universe. Okay? The, the, the solar system, the planets, the earth, all of those things. Okay? Now, now, back to this point. This individual was undergoing all of this evolution from the atomic level all the way to the level of man. Okay? But not only was he man, he was God. Okay? And he was the cosmic creator. Now, how could he come to Earth? There was no Earth. There was nothing but the universe. And there was nothing, nothingness in the universe. Simply nothing. But what he had to do, he had to He had to create the Earth, okay, and the eight other planets, nine planets, okay, total, okay, and one sun, okay, all of those things, okay, back into the universe. The universe, it, it contains everything that we see in the solar system. Now, have you often wondered why black people have such different physical, physical characteristics that are uh, decisively different than any other people in the world? Some of the analogies that I drew earlier, some of the athletes, some of the performers, some of the dancers, okay? As I have been thinking about this process, the only way we can explain it is through a cosmic relationship. Black people have cosmic genes. It's the only way that it can exist, exists because no other people have undergone the kind of evolution, molecular or cosmic evolution, that black people have undergone. At this point, I want to go into the slides, and then we can come back and deal with this whole concept in more detail, and then we can see how life came to Earth. Okay. The picture of the Earth, 200 million years ago. Here is a picture of the Earth 160 million years ago. This is 80 million years ago. And this is the Earth, this is the present day Earth. Now, if you notice very carefully about this, this picture here to the top left, you can see all of the continents are united together. Okay? This is a concept called Pangea, okay? Which is a Greek and Latin word which means all. All land masses are connected together. Here you can see that South America fits into the west coast of Africa almost as a hand in a glove. Here you can see North America, the eastern coast of North America is on the northwestern uh, tip or coast of Africa. All right? Here you can see that we have partial separation of the, uh, the continents. There's a process in geology known as plate tectonics which means that there are plates underneath the Earth's crust that is responsible for the shifting, the continental drifting of continents, all right? So you can see that the continents now begin to separate. 
here 80 million years ago, you can see that the, the basically the continents have almost completely separated. And here in the present day, you can see that they have completely separated. Now, it's very interesting. Here you can see that there's a rift here in Africa that produced the Red Sea. This took place roughly, roughly 50 million years ago. Prior to this rift, rift, there was a river in Africa, okay, larger than the Amazon River. But when this rift took place, this river drained into the Indian Ocean. This was discovered when the space shuttle went up and took pictures from way up, okay? This is a process that they call, uh, it's geochronology, studying the history of the Earth from the beginning of time, okay? There are studies that are being done now on paleo drainage of the Nile Valley, okay? And this was recently brought out. Now, we gotta, we gotta spend a little more time on this because what has happened? When you study oceanography, you come to know that there are deserts underneath the ocean, on, on, the, on the sea floor of the ocean. For example, in North, in North America, there was once an ocean out in the, in the areas of Colorado, Arizona, and Montana, in the area of the Great, or the Grand Canyon. The other thing that, have you ever thought about it? Why is the Earth spherical, circular? Okay, why are the planets spherical, spherical and circular? That's something you need to think about. Another question is, if you notice, as the, as the continents separated, if you can look, there's, there's some similarity between these shapes. They're kind of triangular, almost pie shaped. Have you noticed that? Yes. Not all of them, but there's, there's great similarity between those. On the next slide. You went the other way, right? Okay. Now we're coming to East Africa. Basically, we're dealing with five countries. Ethiopia, the Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. Here what I'm doing, I'm trying to demonstrate how, how and where the oldest fossils so far to date have been found. This is Hadar, Ethiopia. This is where the fossil that you know as Lucy, the woman who was roughly three feet tall, you've heard that name, Lucy. She was found in 1974 by an anthropologist by the name of Johansson. Her common name is Lucy, but the scientific name is Australopithecus Africanus. This, this region is known as the Afar region. That's how she got the name Africanus. Here in the Oma River, where the Oma Valley is. This is where the Homo sapiens sapien was discovered, the oldest Homo sapiens sapien ever found. And that Homo sapiens sapien is over 150,000 years old. It's very important to know that because this was one of the arguments that the Europeans used, that yes, humanity began in Africa, but Homo sapiens sapiens, the evolution of Homo sapiens sapiens was not in Africa, but it was in Europe, okay? But Dr. Diop presented a, an hypothesis that these, these Africans who were born, not only in the Oma Valley, but all along the Great Lakes region, okay? Because this is where most of the Great Lakes are. The Olduvite Gorge, Lake Leotoli, Lake Victoria, Lake Torcana, Lake Rudolph. That they were born in this region and they migrated to the Nile Valley. And there they built the greatest civilization ever elaborated by man. And that was the, the Egyptian, Nubian, and Ethiopian civilization. But this is basically where most of the major finds in prehistoric archaeology and anthropology have been made. Next slide. Now, here what I'm showing you is that there are six, there are six fossils that basically develop man's evolutionary tree. This first fossil is called Australopithecus africanus, and it's three million years old, and it was found in South Africa. This starts the chain of man's evolution from Australopithecus to Homo sapiens sapiens. Australopithecus means ape like man from uh, Australia. If you look at, at the frontal lobe, basically, the forehead is basically virtually non-existent. Non-existent. On the next slide. This is Australopithecus boeci, 
that was found in East Africa by Dr. Leakey, and this slide is roughly 2.5 million years old. This slide is somewhat different than the other. This was a bigger slide, a bigger, a bigger species of Australopithecus than the previous, previous one that I showed you. These were uh, both existed in Africa, and they didn't move into any other uh, continent apart from Africa. On the next slide. This starts a new series of species. This is called Homo habilis, okay? This is the same species of modern man, okay? Homo sapiens sapiens. Here you can see the forehead is considerably different than the two previous uh, species that I showed you. This fossil here is roughly two million years old. It was, born, it was found in uh, East Africa and also in Southern Africa. Recently there's been a report that a, Austro, a Homo sapiens a homo habilis, pardon me, was found in Pakistan. But again, there's, I haven't been able to substantiate that. But this fossil was born in Africa, and it too became extinct in Africa. Next slide. This is Homo erectus, which essentially means upright. And this fossil was over 1.5 million years old. I'm going to take my coat off. I'm bringing up. Erectus means upright. This is the first species of man believed to migrate into Europe, into Asia, and to the South Pacific. Okay? He's also believed the first to use fire. And uh, this fossil was also known as the Java man. On the next slide. This is the Neanderthal. That was found in the Neander Valley, which is in Germany. This fossil is over 130,000 years old. Earlier in anthropology and prehistoric archaeology, it was believed that this is where white people came from. Now, however, there's a different view on uh, the Neanderthal. These men were very robust, more, like, more or less like football players and weightlifters, okay? They, they are extinct now. On the next slide. This is the Homo sapiens sapiens, modern man, the people that we are. And they were found in the Oma Valley, the oldest one. And the chemical substance used to authenticate this is potassium argon. Uh, this fossil here, again, this is the fossil that I had alluded to earlier, that they moved to the Nile Valley and they created civilization. The Homo sapiens sapiens is the only species of man up to date that has been able to do that to create civilization and overcome nature. Next slide. Now where we're coming to, we have three slides. Here in the middle, this man with the big head is the Grimaldian man. This man migrated from Africa roughly 40,000 years ago. As he entered Europe by Spain and remained in the cold for 20,000 years, this fossil here, known as the man of Cro-Magnon, or the cro man, came into existence. This is where the molecular biologists and anthropologists are saying that white people came into being. I don't agree with that position. Dr. Diab was an exponent of that, and many of the uh, anthropologists and molecular biologists, they, they theorized that too. Dr. Albert Churchward, who was an anthropologist and a physician and a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences of Britain, he said that he saw the man of Cro-Magnon, and the man of Cro-Magnon was black. He was African, but the word he used, that he was a Negro. This is very important because if the Grimaldian man did not produce the man of Cro-Magnon, we have to deal with the, the question, what is the origin of the European race? Okay, and perhaps it's not an evolutionary process. Perhaps it is a process of genetic manipulation, similar to gene slicing, what's happening in the field of molecular biology today. It's very interesting because if you look very close at human populations in terms of their migra migratory patterns, the Eskimos who have been living in Alaska, they have been living in Alaska, in Alaska for at least 16,000 years, and they haven't turned European yet. You see, this is something that has to be looked to, into in great detail. Some of the, the, the uh, data that the scholars were using that 
As this man, the Grimaldian man, migrated into Europe by Spain, they remained in the cold for 20,000 years. He said that his, he underwent morphological changes and his pigmentation changed. And then the facial features of his nose, his nasal cavity began to narrow. His lips, rather than be inverted, they were everted. You know, in other words, with a tendency towards narrow lips. But all black people don't have narrow lips. You see? And uh, this is something that we have to be very, very careful about in terms of how we view pigmentation, climatic changes, okay? And also con to consider mutations. This man here is a modern day Sudanese, okay? And you can see that these two men here are essentially the same. Before this man came into Europe, he came from Africa, and he's essentially the same as, as this man. Now, the Grimaldian man was very dwarf, very demented in stature, more like the Twa people, average height, five, four feet, five inches, no larger than that. And they have the dilocephalic heads that are typically African, typically elongated heads that are consider, considerably larger than the man to the left. On the next slide. This is a, a picture of the Piltdown forgery, okay? This is the chewing mandible of an orangutan and the forehead of a homo sapiens sapien. In 1912, Charles Dawson took the lower mandible of an orangutan and the forehead of a homo sapiens sapien, fused the two together, buried it, and later dug it up, and said that there were homo sapiens sapiens in Europe whose brain cavities were larger than the brain cavities of Homo sapiens in Africa, okay? There was a scholar at the British Museum in 1952, Dr. Oakley, who attacked this skull with a drill and also with a chemical substance known as fluorine to determine if the rate of absorption in the forehead and the mandible were the same, but there were, there were intrinsic differences between the two. Then he concluded that this was not a fossil at all, but rather it was a concoction, okay? And that's what I believe, that all of those slides that I have shown you earlier, those are merely nothing more than a figment of the Europeans' imagination. I don't even believe that anthropological in, uh, that anthropological in the molecular biology timetable that those scholars are using at all. The explanation that I gave you earlier, that if life is cosmic, if life evolved in space, when it came to the Earth, it was already fully developed. You see, now you have to ask yourself some kind, several questions. All of those fossils that I showed you earlier, with the exception of the Homo sapiens sapien, all of those could be considered what you call humano humanoids, kind of a human, really more related to chimpanzees and apes, monkeys, that sort of thing. If we agree that African people are ancestral to all other people in the planet Earth, then why are certain people related to chimpanzees and monkeys more than we are? You understand? For example, most Europeans' blood type is A, most Africans is either B or O, Okay, for example, the people in China, pardon me, Russia, have a, have a blood type the same as the European. Okay, pardon me, the same as chimpanzees. All right, there's a rhesus monkey, as some of you may have heard of, that has a genetic constituency the same as the European. On the next slide. Now, here I'm showing you some migratory patterns that the Africans, when they were living in Egypt, as they migrated into Europe, into Russia, 31, going into the Barren Strait to enter the Three Americas, coming to here, 14, in Tasmania, here in Australia. This is because life was a single humanity in the beginning, and it was all African. And this is how the Africans migrated all over the world. Basically, what this shows is that God is everywhere. Do you understand that? This shows if you, if you accept the position that the black man is God, okay, then, the black, then God is all over the earth. You see? And that's something we'll deal with, we can deal with later. 
Now I'm showing you the migratory patterns and later I'll show you how they disperse themselves. Next slide. Here are the Twa people. These are the Mbeti people in Zaire and in the Congo Basin. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why are the Twa people very dwarfed in size? It's something to think about. You see, if life emerged in space, it couldn't be six feet, 10 inches. It would be very difficult for it to move in space. In the physical world, if you look at pilots, basically the pilots who are preferred are what type pilots? Smaller pilots, essentially, okay? Now, with this size, with this size, it has certain advantages. To be small, pygmoid, if you can accept that term, or diminutive, short, miniature in size, for one, they would require less space, they would require less energy, less food, okay? Their movement would be more efficient. You can see the Twa people all over the world. This is in the, the Congo Basin in Zaire, but on the next slide. This is in Malaysia, you see? And here they are, they are hunting for food using the blowgun with the pars with the dots laced with cyanide or arsenic in the same way as the Twa people are in Africa. On the next slide. Here we are. This is the Sakai people also in uh, Malaysia, in the Malaysian Peninsula with high cheekbones, prognatheism, looking typically like the East Africans of Kenya. Also looks like Rachel Johnson, mm -hmm. who was the uh, decathlon winner. On the next slide. This is in New Guinea, okay, out in Melanesia, in the South Pacific. If you look very careful at these black men, you can see that they look very similar. They, in fact, almost look alike. That's because they've been living in isolation. And no genes have been allowed to enter their gene pool, and no genes have been allowed to leave. So they kept everything intact. And this is why they look this way. They've been living in isolation in New Guinea for over 50,000 years. Next slide. This is the Kadir people in India. And these are the Dravidians, the original people of India. You can see, if you can see the top of his head, his hair texture is somewhat different than the Africans because his hair is straight, much straighter than the, the kind of kinky or the curlier type hair that the Africans in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Because there are two type blacks in the world. Blacks who have straight hair on one hand and those other blacks whose hair is more closely cropped to their scalp. Next slide. This is in the uh, Adamese Islands off of the coast of India. And these are Twa people also camouflaged in the trees. Okay? What is interesting about these people living off the coast of India is that the scholars, they wanted to know where these people came from. And one scholar said that possibly they came from a shipwreck of slaves. But how can a whole nation of people come from one ship? You, you see? So it's that kind of ide ideology that was used. If you study this island in more detail, you can see that the people in this region are very related to the people who live in the Kalahari Desert region because many of them have steatopegia and they also have the peppercorn type hair. Next slide. These are the Negritos who live in the Philippine Islands. Okay, they live in the hills of the Philippines. Okay, when the Spaniards came to the islands of the Philippines, they gave these blacks the names Negritos. Next slide. Here's a woman from the island of Luzon. She's among the shortest Twa people in the world. You can see that the eyes are, are slanted, almost looking like she's Oriental. But you can see that she's really not Oriental. Look at the hair, it's frizzy. You can come back into the heart of Africa and you'll find someone who's jet black. Jet black with straight hair or, or frizzy hair looks like Chinese, but Chinese have never been into Africa as conquerors. So that's a trait of DNA polymorphism. Next slide. This is in New Caledonia. 
This is a Twa woman living in New Caledonia. And this woman is, is part of the people in New Caledonia who are fighting for their independence. Some of you may have heard about the people in New Caledonia who are fighting the French now. Next slide. Now we're coming back into the Kalahari Desert. This man is the San Koi that you may know as a Bushman. Here you can see the stomach is almost germinating as if he's lactating or pregnancy, really. Here you can see the posterior is protruding. This comes back to the concept that we dealt with earlier. It's more than just biological phenomenon. It's cosmic genes again. No other people in the universe, in the earth, have been able to display these kind of characteristics but black people. This man has the ability to store fat, food, and, and water and live in the desert without water up to six months at a time without dying of thirst. They convert the fat in this area to simple sugar. It averts starvation and brain damage. Once again, no other people have undergone these kind of uh, mutations as African people have. On the next slide. This is a Khoi Khoi woman, okay, who lives in the Kalahari Desert also, basically in Botswana. If you look at her upper, her upper uh, extremities, you can see essentially there's no body fat. But in the lower extremities, you can see that she has a very striking case of steatopegia, okay? For those brothers who busy themselves with hips, in this case you get more than you bargain for. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, brothers. But this is a very striking, striking example of steatopegia because you find blacks all over the world with this process. On the next slide. But, but I'll, before you go, what is that on the back there, brother? Where, right here? Yeah. That's just a part of the clothing right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. What'd you, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, here, this is another striking case of steatopegia. Let me explain. If you look at the body, look at her arms. She's essentially with no fat. Again, the legs are very small. She's, this woman is obviously, uh, she's lactating. You can see her breast development. She's pregnant, really. But here you can see the posterior is protruding. Okay? Again, this is the steatopegia, the buildup of fatty tissue in the posterior area. But notice how her body is sticking outward here and then protruding there. This helps to dissipate heat. The shape of her body, the way her body is shaped, is more suited to easily, when, her, when respiration is constantly breaking down in, her, body, in her, her system, because sometimes in the Kalahari Desert, Temperatures are as hot as 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit, pardon me. That's almost like being in an oven. Okay? So by breaking down those high energy bonds, this frees uh, energy and she's able to respire and keep her, uh, keep her cool internally. This is again a part of the cosmic genes that I made reference to. No other people have undergone this kind of phenomenon. On the next slide. Now, here, this is in the Andaman, the, uh, Andaman Islands, out uh, near India. Here you can see this boy standing on his mother's posterior again. That's another striking case of steatopegia. And this is very, very far away from Africa. Next slide. Now we're coming back to the Kalahari Desert, and here are some San Koi boys with the peppercorn hair. As we know, melanin is responsible for the pigment in the skin, color in the eyes, and also color of the hair. When the ultraviolet rays from the sun hits the hair, the melanin in the hair traps the light. That part of the light that's not trapped by the melanin hits the sebaceous glands of the scalp and secrete water. The water in the, in the sebaceous glands and the light, the light in the hair, acts as a chamber to avert heat stroke, okay? Again, this is the cosmic genes working again in black people. Just imagine living below the Sahara and then the evolution of our ancestors coming to America, picking cotton, sugarcane, and all other kinds of, of pro uh, products. If we didn't have this kind of hair, what would have happened to us? We wouldn't have been able to survive. So this is how nature prepared us for the experience that we've had in the new world.
Next slide. As well as Africa. Now these are the Kung people who also are inhabitants of the Kalahari Desert. And these people have undergone more mutations than any other people in the world. This is where the, the, the common mother came from, Eve, the woman that appeared on Newsweek magazine, where the mutations, uh, where this woman uh, had undergone more mutations than any uh, individual in the world, and she was the mother of 144 women who took part in this study. Next slide. Now we're coming to the Nubian Desert. And these are the tallest people in the world. These are the Dinkas, okay? Some of you have heard of Manu Bo. This is where he comes from. Some of the women are even seven feet tall in this uh, region. This brother here is very tall. You can see the elongated arms, all right? On the next slide. These are the Nur, who also live in the, in the, uh, the Sudan. If you look at his extremities, you can begin to see how tall that he is. Here is one of the things that they do. They drink the blood of the cattle, and they also uh, drink the milk. They mix the two together. The blood is uh, protein. The milk is a uh, calcium deposit. So it aids in bone formation and also for the elongation of the body. Being having this kind of body surface, it helps to keep the body internally cool because it has more pore space. So having more pore space, he can have more respiration occurring in his body. These are the people, the Nur, the Dinkas, and the Kaka, who live in the Sudan that Dr. Diop used in, uh, at uh, the University of Cairo to say that these people's language was more related to Wolof in Senegal than any other languages throughout Africa. This is some of the linguistic information that Dr. Diop used. On the next slide. These are the Maasai of Kenya and Tanzania. Again, I'm showing you the length, the elongation of the body. Totally different than the, East, the West African because they've undergone a different kind of evolution. Next slide. This is a Maasai woman. Here you can see she's jet black, but look at the slanted eyes. You see, this is polymorphism, okay? No Chinese have ever come into Africa as a conqueror I mean, speaking in terms of a people, okay? But this clearly shows that the African has the genes or the genome, okay, to produce all of the races in the world. Next slide. This is in Sri Lanka, off of the coast of India. And these are, these are Tamil women who are picking tea very much in the way that we pick cotton in this country. Wherever you find black people, anywhere I've been, invariably black people are on the bottom. And I met some of these brothers in Canada, in Toronto, a couple of years ago. And they agreed that they are African. And uh, they really want to know more about us. They're fighting for their independence in Sri, Lan in Sri Lanka too. Next slide. This is a Dravidian woman who is one of the original inhabitants of India. There are over 200 million Dravidians living in India till now, okay? And they really suffered. They really suffered in India in the same way that blacks have suffered all over the world. Next slide. Now we're coming to China. We know that, that the original people of China were black people. The Smithsonian Institute has fully validated that. Some of you may have heard recently that in Vietnam, they discovered an ancient people in Vietnam called the Ruck people. Did you, did you hear about that? Yes. And they, they, they characterized them as having dark skin and kinky hair. So we know that they're black. That's not a, a problem. But not only in Viet, uh, Vietnam, but in Cambodia, Thailand, all of the Far East, black people inhabited those countries originally. On the next slide. These are the Ainu people of Japan. These are not the original people of Japan, but in their, their written, their oral chronicles, they stated that when their ancestors came to Japan, they killed off a very dwarf type people who were living in Japan. Those were the Twa people. The next slide. 
Here I'm showing this slide of a woman who uh, lives in S uh, Sumatra near Indonesia. Here you can see the lip, the fullness of the lips, okay? The black strand is all throughout Indonesia, Malaysia, Borneo. Next slide. Now we're coming to the Arabian Peninsula. We know that uh, in the history of the Arabian Peninsula, the original people of the Arabian Peninsula were the Natufans, okay? This brother here who looks sort of like James Brown is part of those original inhabitants of the, the Nile Valley. This is an Aryan and this is more or less a Semite, a mixture of these two type people. But the original inhabitants of Arabia were undoubtedly black people, undoubtedly black people. Next slide. Now we're coming back to the peopling of the South Pacific. And this woman is the last living inhabitant of the island of Tasmania. She died in 1976. We know that when the Dutch came to the island of Tasmania, they wiped out all of the Africans there. Right? And she was the last living inhabitant of the island of Tasmania. Next slide. Now these are some, some of the the last remaining survivors of the island of Tasmania. If you look very carefully, you can begin to see the different facial features, okay? And that's one of the things that we're interested in, to know how environment impacted black people in various locations all over the world. And you can begin to see different racial features of blacks in certain parts of the world. But these are Tasmanians. Next slide, trust. Okay, now we're coming to the Aborigines of Australia. Here you can see the Aborigines are almost looking like American Indians. And I think one reason for that is we know that the Aborigines of Australia and the Dravidians of India have striking similarities and that the American Indian once migrated from the subcontinent of India. Next slide. Here is an Aborigine girl in Australia. Here you can see she has blonde hair, but yet the skin is black. Again, that's another case of biological phenomena, cosmic genes at work. Here, this is a mulatto who looks similar to the girl, the woman actually who was a uh, tennis player from, uh, yeah, Yvonne Gulagan, right, from Australia. Next slide. Now we're coming to the islands of Melanesia. These are the blackest people in the world. Melanin studies have recently been done to show that contrary to belief, the blackest people in the world don't live in Africa, but the blackest people live in the island of Melanesia. As we know that the word melanos is a Greek word which the Greeks used to denote the blackest of black. Okay? What's strange, this woman is black, but she almost had brunette hair, if you look very carefully. What is also strange is that Melanesia is not along the equatorial plane. It's not really on the equator. You would think, based on studies that had been done beforehand, that the darker you would be, would be as a result of living near the equator. That's why I think we have to look at blackness from a different standpoint. Black people are not black because of the sun but black people are black because of the nature of the universe. They took on the complexion of the environment in which they were born. See, that's so you have to really look at it in a different way, and really, we even have to look at the meaning of melanin in a different way, you see. So this is one of the striking cases uh, in the islands of uh, Melanesia. Next slide. Here, on the opposite side of the island, still in Melanesia, black, but with blonde hair. You see? So this is, again, DNA polymorphism. Those cosmic genes is at work producing all of the facial characteristics throughout the world. Next slide. Here what I'm trying to show you again is different physical characteristics of Africans throughout the world. This is New Caledonia. Look at this woman's hair, frizzy. But they look like the boy, the boy eyes, they look almost oriental, pardon me. But you can see the hair, it's nappy. The hair, pardon me, it's nappy. 
black people. Next slide. Here, this is Professor Simmons. <laughs> kind of look like the professor, doesn't it? This brother is from New Guinea. Well, pardon me, not New Guinea, but it's in Mel Melanesia, okay? In the Melanesian Islands. And on the next slide, what I'm trying to show you is some of the physical variations. This sister is also from Melanesia. Typically African, really. Could be from Durham, anywhere. Basically black. Next slide. This is a Fijian, also in the islands, the Melanesian islands, okay? This is a very interesting island. I met a sister from the Fiji islands, and she showed me her family album, and it would just blew, my, just blew me away, where, where she had black people in her family, coal black, and hair almost to the floor, yes. So I started collecting these pictures from, uh, from Melanesia and the Fiji islands, but this is one of the brothers living in the bush in the uh, Fiji Islands. Next slide. Now we're coming into Papua New Guinea, which is also in Melanesia. Look at the hair texture, okay? A tendency towards blondness, okay? But you can clearly see that the parents are, are black. Next slide. Now we're coming to the continent of North America. And one of the reasons that I'm showing this picture is, how many of you listened to WLIV last week? Did you hear? You were there with William Katz? Okay. Any of you ever been to Denver, Colorado? Have you ever been to the Black Museum in Black Museum of the West in Denver, Colorado? There's a brother in Colorado by the name of Paul Stewart, who was one of my earlier influences, who is a Western historian. His work precedes uh, William Katz, at least by 30 years. But just as most of our scholars, like Dr. Ben and many of the other brothers, really have been teaching on deaf ears, he collected all of this information, really, uh, about the blacks who were living in those areas in Oklahoma, like Boley, Oklahoma. These were all black towns where the blacks in places like Oak Monkey, Oklahoma, and the Indians came together and sort of like mixed together and they had quite an interesting mixture of Indians living there. Even he had the, the, the history of uh, William Pickett, Deadwood Dick, and all of those blacks living uh, in the West at that time. So I'm emphasizing this to show the relationship of Indians and blacks in North America as well as South America. On the next slide. This is an Indian from India who is looking like a Native American Indian, but she's a Dravidian from India. You can see with the nasal cavity and the lip form and the slanting of the eyes. Okay? Yes, but she's a Dravidian from India. Almost looks a little mongoloid too. Next slide. This is a Maori Indian from New Zealand. The Maori Indians from New Zealand exterminated the original people who lived in the island of New Zealand which were called the Maoris. These were black people more towards the Aborigines or the uh, blacks who lived in Tasmania. But now many of the Maoris, they too are black, but it was black people attacking other black people. But I think what happened during the last glacier period, which ended roughly 15,000 years ago, the pigment of these Indians changed. That's why among all the races in the world, the Indians are more related to black people than any of the, of, of the other human populations. You know what she looks like? She looks just like Keith Joseph of the Natchez Purchase Indians. Keith of Joseph? Chief Joseph. Oh, Chief Joseph, okay. You heard of him? Uh, I don't recall the name. Just Flo they from Florida. Okay. Seminoles? Uh, I think so. Yeah, Seminoles, okay. Now, this picture here is from Mexico. These are the black Indians of Mexico. If you go down into Mexico, Brazil, you'll find black Indians all through that area, even to now. Next slide. These are Indians living uh, off of the coast of South America, way down at the very tip near the, uh, the Strait of Magellan. Okay? But you can see that they're very dark. Next slide. This is an Indian, look at the pigment, the hair, from Brazil. 
basically black. Next slide. Here, now we're coming, now we're coming to Egypt, okay? And we have to deal with some of this. Uh, Egyptology, as, D, as, as uh, Dr. Diaz said, is really a product of colonialism, and really it has a lot to answer for in terms of the falsifications that it has committed against black people. And basically what I'm showing you here is the Aini people, the people that Sheganta used in Cairo at the symposium for the peopling of ancient Egypt and the decipherment of Marodic script. Here he showed this, this uh, slide of the Ani people to show that these were the ancient people who populated the Nile Valley. Of course, those scholars like Dr. Abu Bakr and Abdullah, the Arab contingents, naturally opposed him in his views. But nevertheless, these are the people that he used. On the next slide. This is another picture that he used of Namur, and he said that Namur was even blacker than the Wolofar today, okay? And many of the others, trust that we, we have, you can show them, these were some that he used on the next slide, okay? Zosar was another that he used to say that he was typically African from the Third Dynasty. Next, Khufu and Cheops, another one. I'm just running through these. This is Ciceros the first from the 12th dynasty. Go ahead. And Akhenaten, right. The next one. I think this is Ramesses the second. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, this is Nefertari. Next slide. Okay, here now, what we're doing here is showing how the Egyptians portrayed themselves in A how they portrayed the other Africans in B, Af in Africa, and how they portrayed the Lucoderm races in B and D. This represents the Semitic races, and this represents the Aryans, okay? But basically what this is showing, that the Egyptians portrayed themselves black, and they considered themselves black as well as the, the other blacks, but they knew who the foreigners were. And this is what we're showing between the Semitic races and the Europeans. Next slide. Okay, this is the Sphinx with the nose missing. Okay, next slide. These are the step pyramids, the introduction of architecture to the world. Next slide. These are the pyramids of Giza. And what I'm showing here is that this was a period when many uh, Greek scholars came to Egypt to really to study. This was like 465 years before Jesus Christ, as you know, the theorem that's alleged to be the theorem of Pythagoras, c squared equals a squared plus b squared. Pythagoras was a Greek mathematician who came to Egypt after hearing from Talus about the mysteries of Egypt, and that's how the theorem ended up in Greece. Next slide. What's that? Upside down. Okay. This is Juba. Juba in the uh, in the Sudan. And these brothers here are similar to the Koi Koi. The not the koi koi, the the kwa kwa, who Dr. Diop said that were related to uh, the Wolofs. Okay, these brothers in Juba, in Arabic, Juba means the land of the blacks. But in Juba, they um, they had problems with the Arabs, so they went into the hills to hide from the Arabs. Uh, Next slide. Anything related to the Beju, the Meju, the Meju in um, the Nuba Mountains? So very similar to them. Very similar. This right here represents a beauty contest in Senegal, and this is some of the confusions that Dr. Diop had to relate to the ancient Egyptian. And these are Senegalese women here, Fulani, basically. Next slide. Does anyone have the license in place, CLI-24F? If you do, you're blocking someone. One more time. Okay. Here we go, coming back to the slides. Here, these three girls right here are Senegalese. This is an Egyptian girl here. 
and showing different hairstyles relating to that to show that the, that the Egyptians were basically just like the co contemporary Africans black. Next slide. This is in Malay. This is to the tomb of Aski of the Great of Gao, showing the step pyramids, similar to the architecture of the step pyramids. Next slide. This is in Zimbabwe. This is the Great Wall.